Uh, is going to talk about the instrumental uh, system and pipelines, uh, what we can do in the gas. So, uh, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, this is a discussion, so I don't have. I, I put some slides together to sort of spark the discussion, but Lily has already. I mean, we can really continue. There's a lot of overlap uh, between these uh, these discussions, uh, so so we can continue. And uh, Sevilla has a talk a discussion this afternoon. We talked a little bit. Of, we have some overlap there, I think, as well. But I think it's okay. We can just if there's more thoughts, for, uh, we can continue this afternoon at, at four. When Sevilla is, is talking. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about. We've talked a huge amount of uh, stellar activity, and that's of course incredibly important. But I also wanted to sort of let us focus a little bit on the systematics from the instruments. And, and the pipelines and so on and so forth. There's been some really good points, I think, here in the, in the earlier discussion with uh, collaboration and sharing and, and all these things. So, uh, so I just wrote down, uh, you know, the precision of the instruments has really had a dramatic, dramatic increase uh, over the last just few years, really, but also, of course, the last decades. And, and, and like, likewise, we've really uh, moved very, very far in, in understanding stem activity. But it's we were just discussing which is what, right? I mean, what 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 are what what is the instrument and what is the actual stellar activity that we're seeing, and that's really it's really confounded and it's very hard to separate. I think, and I think we should, especially <clears throat> maybe the people who have not worked directly with instruments uh, or pipelines, but maybe uh, look at the radio velocities. I, I think as as somebody working with the pipelines, it's it's not a. Engraved in stone radio velocity with a, an error bar. It's it's really a moving target depending on, on <laughs> how you you know extract the data and so on and so forth. And I just want to I think we should all appreciate that that, that there's a lot of, of work still. I think uh, even though the instruments have come very far, the pipelines have come far. There's still work to be done on on, on the radio velocities itself from the from the from the spectrographs. And we can't. It's really hard to measure. How do we do it? I and mean, we can. You know, inject a calibration light in two fibers and compare, but that's really kind of inside the instrument. We we really want to test the whole system, including you know the tellurics in, in the in the atmosphere and so on. So, uh, and we have really no target for that, except maybe we can somebody can launch a laser frequency comb uh, light source orbiting the Earth. Then that would be a perfect like test for the instrument. Uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> So anyone who wants to do that, that would be great. But we really don't have anything to to really test the instruments at the centimeter or ten centimeter per second level. It's very very difficult. So so uh, I think we should have <coughs> that. Um, I've taken some plots here uh, to just sort of spark the discussion. This is Xavier was nice enough to share this uh, today with me. Uh, I remember he had <coughs> some nice plots with the Harps data and Harps South data with the sun. And so uh, I think this is the the yellow is the harp north, and then uh, harp south takes over somewhere. And you can see that the two uh, this is just one date, uh, and, and and here's another day. And you can see they really trace what the sun is doing very 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 well here, and we have a very low RMS. Um, but what Sevilla has done here, I think, is to adjust the zero point of the two instruments uh, so so they match up. And then uh, throughout the night, we really trace each uh, the two instruments trace each other very well. However, if you look at the night to night uh, shifts, there's not as good uh, agreement. You see the difference here. Uh, so again, the blue and the and the and the yellow is up north and up south, and you can see that there's disagreement, sort of, uh, at, you know, peak to peak at a few meters per second on the uh, on the daily or the nightly or the wavelength calibration in the afternoon, basically. And I think this is not only harps. This is probably Many of the instruments that we're working with, uh, the, the daily calibration is, is really uh, is really a place where we need to work uh, more. And so here's a plot from a recent paper. I can't see that. No. But uh, and and this is I guess a little unfair because it's not a super bright target. So we have a, we have a series of Harps South spectra and then uh, Espresso later. <laughs> And you can kind of see by eye in the residuals that you know the, the new instruments are really uh, more precise. And there's also uh, you know photon noise here issues because this is an 11 point something magnitude star. So part of this can certainly be photometric. But uh, I think there's the instruments are really improving. The next generation instruments are still improving, and, and it's just to say that there's still I think work to be done uh, in the instruments. So uh, I wanted to show just. This is, I have a few more slides and then I'm, I'll stop talking. I want to show sort of uh, the zero point of the instruments, basically the raw drift of the instruments when they're not calibrated. And this is something we 
don't see a lot in the literature, I would say, but I think it's quite interesting to see. Uh, this is Carmen, as they did publish this, uh, uh, and you see the top plot here is actually the raw drift of the instrument without any calibration over four years of data. And you can see pretty large, you know, excursions. There's, you know, somewhat nice uh, small RMS here, but you see these interventions, I think, uh, was it, it was Annelise saying you should not care about uh, warm-ups uh, on other instruments, but in fact, I think all of these excursions are when interventions have been done to uh, warm up the cryostat or something else. And this also happens on, <laughs> on other instruments, I think, on most of them. And if we want to do like 10 centimeter per second over years uh, to, to, to look for temperate planets around solar type stars, it's an issue that we have a, a kilometer per second peak to peak drift uh, of, of, the, of the raw instrument. And it's not because they're not keeping the temperature well controlled. Uh, you see here the it's a few tenths of a degree that you have changes even when you have these interventions. And another thing is that the instruments are quite, uh, the response to temperature changes for the different instruments is very different. So it really depends on the, not so much the optical design, but maybe the optical mechanical design of how you, how you, uh, you know, design your instrument. And that's something that you should really think about as well, if, especially if you're thinking about new instruments. Uh, because, of course, calibration is critical. We need super good calibrations, but you can only calibrate so much. Right? I mean, uh, and, and if you have a really large drift in the instrument, it's difficult. <clears throat> so, how about Harps North? These are some uh, plots I did myself. Uh, so, this is basically thorium argon of a year of data and no wavelength calibration. They're just cross correlated. So, you see what's going on in the instrument. And you see like a tiny RMS, and then you see this big jump uh, owning to these warm-ups uh, of, of the cryostat. Uh, when I think at this point there was a leak, but there was also water. I think in the in the that had to be cleaned out. And you see these kind of jumps uh, at a hundred meter per second level uh, throughout like a year of data. And then um, oh, I'll skip that one. That was that was uh, twenty twenty. Don't mind the arrows. There's something wrong with the error bars here. But again, you see a, a full year of of, of very nice behavior actually in the instrument, and then you see these jumps you really have to, to deal with. And this is what I had when I was doing this uh, in the beginning of 2021. Uh, and you see here just a month of data, and the RMS of the raw drift of the spectrograph is really small. It's really impressive, at 60 centimeters per second. And in fact, <clears throat> when you try to apply a wavelength solution to this and then cross correlate the thorium argons, you would expect. Or you would hope a flat line would come out, uh, no, no RMS. But in fact, you get about the same RMS uh, when you apply the wavelength solution. I, I did see the outliers kind of come down. I, I don't have a plot for that. Sorry, but you, you have to imagine. Yeah. So just to be clear, here you come uh, here. You didn't do any wavelength nope. solution. So it's just uh, it's the yeah. instrument. Okay. Just the instrument here and over over a month, which is really impressive. It's really stable, and 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 more than I think. Uh, if you look at Carmenes and, and and some other spectrograms, it's. it's so this is really so. But the, the point is here that if you calibrate, you don't. It doesn't become much better. Uh, this is a, it, you bet, might as well not do anything for this uh, this <laughs> month of data. Yes. You mentioned the cost of like the for an all of that. If you try different, like the kind of cost, doesn't like the display. It's hard to hear what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> and you mentioned the cost of like the for an all of which you know, is completely stable. But if you check with again the cost of like frequency going for. Yeah. Well, if we had a laser frequency going, <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Uh, <laughs> well, we, we, we had a sort of itch, but not, it's not been running uh, for a long time. Uh, so that, that's a good question. But I, uh, you, 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 I think you would see similar behavior. What, basically, what this is showing you is that the instrument is really, really stable over short periods of time when you don't have, instrument, when you don't have sort of interventions. Yeah. And this is another point to the space-based uh, it would be fantastic with an RV spectrograph in space, but I mean, I don't know. We see all these, you know, people with screwdrivers and wrenches going in and changing and warming up and so on and so forth. And, and I worry that you know, launching something into space. But maybe we should think that way because if we can, if we can avoid these kind of interventions that happen here, or we'll, if we want to find year-long timescale of planets or have multi-year stable radial velocities, we should, maybe we should think of how to not touch an instrument for like four or five years. <laughs> Like if it went to space, 
Okay, uh, so I was going to have a nice plot. Of, or I wanted to find something about systematic instrument systematics. And there was not. I googled, and the best thing I came up with was this instrumental cover of a song called Systematics. So <laughs> it's kind of hard to illustrate. But so here are some ideas thrown up on the screen. Um, what can we? So this is now. It's your guys' turn. Uh, I would like to open a discussion of how we could perhaps improve our understanding of the instrumental systematics and the mitigation of these. Uh, so I put up some ideas, Just uh, I'll just read through them while you also think about what, if you have any comments. So one thing could be to talk about new ways to extract radio velocities. I noticed knew it uh, yesterday with Sam was using uh, the Delta function template, using espresso masks. Are there other ways we could think of that maybe it's really a successful uh, uh, a method, I, and we see others working directly on the spectra, it's a mitigation and using the whole spectra and so on and so forth. Maybe we should consider that. Uh, what can we do with the laser frequency combs if we have them on all the instruments? Many of the instruments are now getting laser frequency combs and the richness of that calibration is just tremendous. And I, there's been a lot of work already, but I, I'm not sure that the, we've exhausted the, the detail of these laser frequency combs and what we can do with them. Uh, in, in sort of mitigating the setup, uh, instrumental systematics. Another thing I want to stress is uh, many radio velocity uh, extraction pipelines, the uncertainty on the, on the data point is much of it, or majority of it is, is photometric uncertainty, or uh, no, shot noise, basically, photon noise. And, and you all know that if you have a data point with a large uncertainty, it's okay, you know, it doesn't affect your overall fit or whatever that much, but if you have a, like a tiny uncertainty, but it's actually strongly influenced by systematics, that's a real problem, right, for your overall solution. So uh, improving the uncertainties that really reflect what the systematics of the instrument is doing is, I think, crucial, and maybe something we could <clears throat> consider doing better in, in the community. And then uh, to, to David's point, and the last point here is, uh, there's a lot of openness. I think we saw, I was part of the Kepler mission in the beginning, I remember, and there was, it was very, so let's you know, hold on to the data and blah, blah. And then things changed. I was talking to Vincent about this yesterday, uh, and, and really all of the data has been, become public, and it's been a tremendous success, the Kepler mission, because people have worked, everybody has had access to the data. Same with the test mission, and I, I hope we can see even more of that in the RV community. In particular, I think, uh, with the instrument, because you know, new teams come with an instrument. We all want to, we understand the pressure, right? It's enormous pressure to show that we're doing, you know, sub centimeter per second precision. We don't want to show all the dirty laundry because, oh, then people think we haven't done a good instrument and so on and so forth. But I think uh, actually showing the dirty laundry, showing, not cherry picking results and showing everything, I think would benefit the community tremendously. The calibration data, uh, pipelines, uh, what the real instrument precision, even the bad instrument precision, <laughs> what that is. So basically, uh, you know, sharing that with the community, I think, would be uh, even more would be would be an important step. So that was all I had, uh, and I, I open the floor to discussions. If you have anything you want to contribute with, that would be great. All right. Do you just want to leave the <clears throat> Sure, yeah, no, I'm happy to do that, yes. Uh, I see, uh, oh, the last thing David has been the first. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> um, but, uh, well, I have, I think I have three very fast things to say. One thing is, we're trying to measure the, the, the center of mass of a distant star, and we're using the stellar surface as it emits to us. And then, of course, you have the atmosphere in your floppy instrument flopping around at a centimeters per second. Um, and uh, one, one comment I have is we could think about the surface of the star as also being part of the instrument. If we can't fly that laser frequency comb at L1, or L2, I guess, is the way you put it, um, then, then maybe we have to, maybe we have to just accept that the surface of the star is part of the instrument, and then we think about calibration a different way. So that's one comment. Another comment is housekeeping data is so valuable, and we do take a fair bit of housekeeping data. But if you look at the LIGO, LIGO mission, I think LIGO takes something like ten thousand channels of housekeeping data, and the more precise you want to be, 
the more housekeeping data you need to take. We just need tons of housekeeping data. And in some sense, activity indicators are like housekeeping data on the stars, and we also need housekeeping data on the instrument. And then my third comment is, I'm sorry, is I think the instruments like the stars are actually managed by a small number of latent variables. So there's a lot of this room fitting stars with latent variables, FF prime and all that stuff is fitting stars with latent variables. I think we should also fit instruments with latent variables. And we should think of the instrument as being a physical object that is doing, that, that has a latent structure. Yes, right, very good points, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we should probably maybe also take a step back, maybe sometimes we should not just take the radio velocity data points from the pipelines, but maybe think about going even one step further and, and as a community working on the, the calibration more, uh, for example. So, yeah. yeah, so thanks a lot, David, for raising this point. I think we should indeed, like, not start to retake in terms of just radio velocity points, but really the spectrum that we have. And not just only, I don't know, fitting GPs or spectral, things like that. There is plenty of systematics that we see at the detector level that are not possible to collect at the extraction level because it's really very complicated to do. But then those things propagate in the radio velocity. Plenty of different effects due to the detector are mixed up together. And then it's just impossible to model them at the radio velocity level. So there is a lot of things we can do, like post-processing the spectra that we extract mm -hmm. to collect those systematics. And I think we can improve quite a lot on this aspect. Yeah. Yeah, I and there will be some talks this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I should say that it would be good to get uh, yeah, also more junior people. Yes, that. sorry about that. I was all the way there. Um, so on the the topic of housekeeping data and sort of what data sets do we have? Is there something to be said for increasing uh, in your instrument design the number of sensors? So are there ways that we can measure different effects within the instrument itself and use that as a data set? So I don't know more temperature sensors, more sensitive temperature sensors. Um, yeah, things like that. I, th I think that's an excellent idea. I, I worked with Andreas Seifert and he's like Mr. Temperature Sensor, basically. He puts as many temperature sensors as he can on everything, like as many as possible. And, I, and, I, and just, I think releasing that data as well would be very helpful. Uh, so really measuring the instrument in, in many different, it's very difficult to figure out what goes on though, I mean, I must say, because uh, it's, it's also latency. You have heat maybe somewhere and and that can be delayed in the showing up in the radio velocity, so it's quite a, a mess, I guess. But a, uh. <laughs> actually, following on from that, sorry, I'm, I'm usurping the chat person's job. But, uh, so you showed in the Carmenes broad drift that temperature was clearly important, but I, I was wondering, is it temperature or is it something that temperature is also tracing? Because I guess temperature, temperature, all these things are linked. Do you have a feel for that? I think the temperature is crucial. The, the question is how strong. So one of the things that uh, I've, I've, I've noticed is for, that when people do a sort of a, before they install an instrument, they do sort of a let's see an error budget, right? And we and try to you know maybe even go through uh, Zmax models and see what the effects are if you change the temperature here and there, and and we get out some numbers. But the fact is there are often many several factors, maybe even an order of magnitude wrong sometimes. The temperature. For example, dependence is much larger uh, than you had hoped. <laughs> and uh, well, I think temperature is, is crucially important. I, and uh, there's also stuff about how you hang things if they, you know, if things change over time, gravity, and so. The, but I think temperature, and since they're all in vacuum, uh, so there's outgassing, of course. But but uh, but that you can really deal with that. So temperature is one of the key uh, key things. But it may, it's, yeah, it's hard to say. There may be other things. Yeah, and there. Uh, so moving the focus a little bit to the, the low expand. So most of the data that we have on the, to model the toys are mainly on the ground. So temperature of the instrument, the humidity and, and air mass and so on. But we don't have any, for example, wind measurements to help to motivate the better toic model based on the current atmospheric conditions. So it could be a way to improve on that part. Yes. 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 Um, I was wondering if there was already a kind of structured study of the influence of the different uh, uh, things that we can monitor with the housekeeping data, like uh, 
just a linear fit or yeah. uh, see, see what is actually influencing uh, that? I'm I, maybe I'm not aware. I I, I know that uh, I can maybe find that plot, but I Andreas Seifer from Runex sent me something where he was trying to correlate all his gazillion temperature sensors uh, to the raw drift of the instrument, and he was actually able to at least somewhat predict, not well enough, I think, but you could really see that you could sort of predict from from temperature what the instrument was doing. And again, Runex has a larger than hoped. Uh, even though it's doing fantastic in the calibrated spectra, I think uh, it has a larger than hope sort of instrumental drift uh, with time, more than they had. And I think we, they learned something, and I think we know why uh, that is. It's something to do with the camera is sort of separated, and the camera then heats up, uh, and then it actually moves uh, compared to, this, to the full spectra. For example, this is a problem. And, and even if you get, like, one thing is movement, but if you get skew of the camera, the CCD, that's, that's a bad <laughs> that gives you sort of... Oh, Adverse mm -hmm. effects, but so I don't know if uh, other than what I showed with Carmen is not a lot of people sort of publish. I know Sevilla has a plot in one of his papers with the raw sort of drift, a, a tiny one, <laughs> uh, where you can see the raw drift of parts. But I, that would I would encourage that too because that is kind of an eye opener when you see these big, big drifts that we have to calibrate. Uh, I, oh, yeah. I was trying not to raise my hand too early. Okay, well, let's try down there. Down there, you had a you had a, yes, yes. I just wanted to say that. I think a very important part of all these studies is that we need to sometimes stop overestimating our instruments because we tend to think they are great. <laughs> they are. <laughs> but one of the first things I realized when moving from harps to espresso is that a lot of noise that I and the community were blaming on the stars was the instrument. Yes. The same stars suddenly had like really beautiful and smooth activity curves that seemed like space light curve almost. And we were like trying to correct them as stellar activity and they were not. So that was an effort condemned to, it was meant to fail, it couldn't. And that, 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 I think that's an excellent comment. That's exactly why I was I proposed this discussion today. It, it's, it's also this, right? That the, the teams are under heavy, heavy pressure. We all know this. We want to we wanna get money for the next instrument or for maintaining the instrument or all this. And, and we have to show that it works well. So I think this is, there's an enormous amount of pressure to really show that it's doing well. Uh, but, but it's true that we see now that the yeah. Sometimes the star we thought was active is actually that was actually the instrument. Sometimes. Yeah, they were doing great, but not as great as we liked. <laughs> exactly. There was a comment right behind you. Uh, yeah. So I found your your plot showing the the solar data from Harps and Harps North kind of compared really interesting. Has anyone tried doing a, a similar thing? So taking two or more instruments and simultaneously observing the same target. And then yeah. directly comparing. Yeah, that talk yesterday. I think Lily and, and Sevier are working together and trying to get this month of solar data from Express, uh, Harps, uh, Newit, others, especially. No, not right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not just solar data, right? No, just also, also actually, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear, I didn't appreciate yeah. Yeah, No, that's, I think that's important as well, Get you know, getting the standard star, but we all have the problems with the standard stars as well, right? But <laughs> I, I, I think there was a poster. On the first day, where somebody was trying to take three standard stars, who was it? Was it? Uh, I can't remember who it was. Uh, and look at sort of the zero point of the instrument by averaging those three data points. Uh, that's one of the posters, I think. That's also something you can do. See how the if the standard stars move together. <laughs> Other than that's a cosmic coincidence, or it's the instrument. <laughs> uh, yeah, anyone? Well, I thought just a comment. On this. The problem is then for the sun. We, it's easy to observe several hours every day yeah. and to have simultaneous data. For stars, it's much more difficult with the uh, constraint of the telescopes, different time zones. And the problem is that you have stellar signals from minutes to your time scales. So even if you take two, hour, two measurements that are two hours apart, they might be affected by a meter per second offset due to gravitation. At least there is no way you will be able to resolve that. Yeah. Well, hopefully for the sun, uh, because we can have this uh, continuous time series of uh, every day, we are able to understand much better what is happening. Yeah. But it's a little bit easier to decorrelate stellar activity from instrument systematics. But that's, a, that's a good point. Yes. I think we had a comment on Slack. Yeah, well. yes. just a Slack comment from yes. Eric um, about housekeeping data. Uh, the NAID ELO data includes the calibration and sky, sky fibers in every frame. Uh, so, if anybody is particularly eager, there is a ton of data in the Ethylene Calibrator Pix that could be extended. Very good. 
All right, Good open point. challenge. <laughs> uh, Lily, I, think. Uh, I feel like the crux of a lot of those key things that people are saying is the information you get out of the LSD data. And so we, we take all this calibration data to inform our spectrum, right? But every single time we take a wavelength calibration where we understand the source that we're looking at, you're really sampling how well your instrument is interpreting that information, which we understand fully. And so it's not just giving you wavelength calibrations, it's telling you how your instrument is responding to the certain, like the housekeeping data, the temperatures, the pressures that you have. And so like you showed with Carmenis data, something we did with Express is we use all of the LSD data we have across several months, and we create this like hierarchical model to see how the instrument varies as it's reflected in the different LSD sector that we get. And we do a PCA of that to kind of just like the dimensionality reduce that data, and the first principal component amplitude almost exactly traces the optical bench temperature. And so it's like this very clear understanding of what your instrument is doing, what it's responding to. We can plot it with respect to other housekeeping data to understand what is affecting the spectra that we're seeing, which will ultimately affect the RVs that you derive. And it also makes suggestions, right? Like it expresses passively temperature controlled. And so maybe if we had a doer or something, that would change. But it might also, if we did the same thing with the new data that Eric is proffering, right? Maybe we'll see that when they fill up the nitrogen tank, that's what it all chases that or something like that. So I feel like I would just we should get together and I'll add like eight or 10 things to the list. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very good. Uh, uh, Jen? Yeah. Uh, a thing that we've been pondering a little bit uh, on the like NASA XEP side is the potential value of trying to put together a public data reduction pipeline built around the NUID pipeline and in the future KPF that would be posted at NextSci where you could come and like plug in different modular parts of it and kind of see how they impacted both the RVs that come out and all of the activity indicators and things. So I'd be curious if that is something that people think is of interest, of value. This is a few years out, so it's not an immediate project, but you could come and say, okay, if we you know, do the spectral extraction this way instead, what does that change? If we do the measurement of the activity indicators using you know, my version of it versus the standard one, what does that affect? And it could be one way to try and at least pinpoint where some of the discrepancies between the RVs that we're measuring are coming from and be able to draw more direct lines. Yeah, yeah. And comments um, So just responding to what you said, I think that would be brilliant, but it makes extra sense if we plug it in to a library that implements tests and metrics as we were discussing mm -hmm. after Lily's um, contribution. Um, and so that would be a very valuable thing. I had a question, but it's, it's kind of been partially answered by what Lily just said. It, it was to do with the fact that we're kind of moving from an era dominated by uh, spectrographs that are mainly calibrated using thorium argon and uh, fabry perot to an era mainly uh, dominated by spectrographs calibrated with LFC. And for somebody like me, who's a bit further from the instruments and the calibration process, I wondered if you could comment on how that will change the way in which we calibrate and whether we should expect differences in the kind of systematics we'll see because of the change of calibration source or whether we, it's, we're kind of blind to that? Uh, I, I think the laser frequency codes in particular will help. I mean, the, we know that, but in what way is kind of difficult, right? But for example, I think uh, for uh, if you calibrate with a thorium argon, you have maybe 10, let's say 15 good lines per order that you can use. With the laser frequency comb, you have many, many, maybe 100 or more. And I think uh, I talked to Julian Stoimer, who's also part of MMX, and he discussed that the wavelength calibration, so, so many times we just fit an ordinary polynomial uh, to the pixel position and, and the wavelength of the thorium line, which by the way are not known very well, uh, to hundreds of meters per second, but the laser frequency comb are. And it turns out that the complexity that we fit thorium argons with is much too small. I mean, the, when you see the laser frequency comb, you can see a much higher complexity. You need to go to, rather than maybe three or fourth order, you need to go to a polynomial of 10 or 11th order per order to really fit it out. So I think we can really use laser frequency combs uh, much more. And, and you talk about etalons and fabric growth. I, I had enormous hope for these, uh, but I, I, we've seen, uh, I think especially on newer too, uh, and, and others have seen that there's this chromatic drift of the etalons over time, and it's actually quite significant. It's maybe many tens of meters per second over weeks where you have sort of the, the different parts of the etalon drift, and it's a complicated, uh, can be a complicated uh, drift that you see. So etalons are at least the current state, and I, I, correct me anybody if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's completely understood what's going on. It's probably something to do with the coatings that are changing over time and stuff like that, in changing the the width of the cavity in the etalons, 
so I had I had to personally because that could be cheaply laser frequency cones, but I right now it looks not as as promising as, as some of us had hoped. <laughs> but laser fre frequency cones are really important. Yeah, I was thinking more. I mean, I I kind of gathered that they would be an improvement. Uh, or oh, everybody hopes so. Right, right. Uh, but it's more whether we would expect less or more chromaticity, or so whether we would expect things to be on different time scales. I guess we don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think we should look uh, much more carefully into it. But there's been, I mean, especially in the Express, uh, there's been a lot of work on the laser frequency probes, but uh, and others too. Uh, but yeah, I, I think there's more work to be to be to be done in that area. There's such a rich data set, but also even look at the PSF change and stuff like that. Lily, did you have a challenge? Here? I can I can make it very quick, but yeah, I would just say like as you were saying, like would we think about it differently? And I think it's very obvious, like Lars was saying, like you the, the implicit trust that we have in the LOC has completely changed how we consider those calibration data in the pipeline. So like when something goes wrong with the thorium argon or we see something that we don't expect, the first thing people do is check what's happening with the thorium argon lamp. But if we see something we don't expect with the LOC, which we know we trust a lot more, then people start looking at the pipeline or the spectrograph or instrument. So by having this thing where you trust what's happening with it completely and allows them to make statements not about your calibration source, but the instrument that you're also using to look at. So that brings us into a whole other regime of how to construct pipelines to deal with your instruments. Right. If I can just comment on that, I, I agree in principle, but laser frequency codes are also not perfect, and they can they can be difficult as well to work with, uh, and they can be you know, relations that you. But there was a recent paper where two laser frequency cones was shown through, I think, Harps South, right? And and you could see like one centimeter per second agreement uh, over some time scale, uh, which was uh, I think the first time this was proven that two cones actually agreed to to a centimeter per second level. So that's very encouraging. Yeah, I, think, uh, I think it's a good place to, to end on a high note. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thank you, everybody, for uh, talking this session.